So great to have everybody here. It looks like a nice turnout today. Um, really excited to be here. Uh, Kim Merker from Noble9. I'm the COO, and I'm very honored to be uh, hosting a panel discussion about full stack observability. And um, I guess we're going to learn what that is in just a little bit. Uh, really, the big the big thing here is about this idea of a common language and that uh, that common language of SLOs as, as part of that full stack observability story is what we're going to talk about today. So um, just to kind of give you a little bit of background uh, no, about Noble9 and the why we're here today. So we've been working closely with um, folks at Cisco, uh, specifically the AppDynamics team and the Thousand Eyes team, as well as our friends and partners at Worldwide Technologies, WWT. Um, and we're uh, seeing a lot of interesting things happen in the market. And one of the cool things is this idea of full stack observability, which is, um, you know, we're going to kind of learn what it means and how it fits and how SLOs, service level objectives, can help you both with a reliability and with efficiency of delivering uh, your software and your IT processes. Um, so that's what we're going to get into in just a minute here. And the really cool part is we're going to also have a demo. So you'll see how these products fit together and how they actually work in practice, um, which is, I think, also a really cool thing. So we'll chat a little bit, learn a little bit, uh, hopefully a few surprises along the way, and uh, get into a demo. And then, of course, questions. You know, if you want to ask a question, feel free to use the Q&A functionality. Um, we'll take those kind of toward the end, but I'll keep an eye on those as they're coming in. And uh, let's get going. So first of all, let's meet our panel. Um, and we're not going to go through and introduce everybody, but we've got uh, Renato from AppDynamics, Hans from Thousand Eyes, Mark from uh, Worldwide Technology, uh, Jeremy from Noble9, as well as Mike from Noble9. And he's a recently joined us from Redfin. He's a SRE practitioner. So he's going to hopefully give us a, a, you know, kind of a customer point of view uh, on things as we go in here. So uh, I'm going to stop sharing now and let's get into the panel. Say hi, everybody. Awesome. Great. Okay. So let's just jump right into it. So I'm going to start with Renato. Um, what does full stack observability mean? Full stack observability is just an evolution of monitoring, right? Think about the same way you see SLOs versus KPIs and it evolves. Full stack observability is about eliminating the silo monitoring perspective and bringing all that together and helping the domains, the different domains involved in the delivery of an application to collaborate and communicate and make better decisions, better decision testers. So, um, Mike, from your point of view, you think about this full stack observability thing. You're coming in, like I mentioned, from Redfin. You're kind of new to Noble9, so you haven't fully drank the SLO Kool-Aid maybe. I don't know. But how do you see this full stack observability in the market? Is this something you see practitioners talking about, or is it more kind of a marketing term? What do you think? I wouldn't say I've seen anyone mention that term specifically, but there is definitely a desire for something that helps reduce some of that complexity with with our systems it's getting a bit out of control right um, a single web page load might now send a dozen backend requests to different services or third-party integration partners or you know even across like across infrastructure as a service uh, platforms like there's there's so much breadth to an individual request now it's hard for us as operators to really grok how wide this request is going to be and and get a feel for uh, which components might be causing poor poor behavior for the customer experience so i think Teams really want something that can I, I provide observability around this this new style of uh, of service workflow, um, and something that could get, give us the ability, yeah, to like zoom in on the individual components that might be failing, or ask new questions about the data across the stack, not just the application layer, but the network and the infrastructure. Um, something like that that would let us dive really deep on any individual piece would be a huge win for any anyone that's trying to you know keep their services online or or debug any incident that's uh, affecting customers. Okay, so so actually, I want to ask Hans about this because you're coming from the Thousand Eyes side, and for people who don't know, you know, Cisco acquired um, Thousand Eyes back in May 2020. But so from your perspective, you know, what was what's kind of the driving reason behind the the uh, full stack observability story, and how is Thousand Eyes helping Cisco to do that? I mean, just around the acquisition, you know, Cisco. Not a lot of people think of Cisco as one of the largest software companies in the world, but it is. Um, and the Thousand Eyes acquisition fits in with that uh, conviction that has been driving that transformation within Cisco. Um, that it is, it's, it's really about the application and delivering exceptional digital experience to the end user. Um, so Thousand Eyes fills a huge gap there uh, in terms of end-to-end -end visibility because it gives like application owners a 
ability to measure and observe the application from essentially anywhere in the world. So it gets them much closer to the end user and gives them the act the, the same perspective that the end user has. Um, and then it gives operations or network teams an ability to see exactly how the application is being delivered across the internet or to the cloud or from remote worker locations or across VPNs or a corporate WAN, um, you know, and that's all part of that complexity story, right? Like it's just, <laughs> everything is going everywhere. Um, so I think the thousand, thousand eyes uh, in the context of Cisco really fits in well and brings us closer to the goal of kind of getting that level of visibility that allows you to start asking the questions that you didn't no needed to be asked in the first place, which is like one of those core aspects of what observability really is. So, so if I'm kind of understanding the, the thread so far, so basically we're evolving monitoring, the complexity is increasing, the, the people in the world need these tools to, to better understand their, their systems and multiple tools working together is really, I think the key, the key piece of this. So that, this kind of leads me to Mark, who's on the in WWT side, who's, you know, in the real world of end customers, what's it like out there? You know, what do you see uh, with this full stack observability world? What do the environments look like? And how do you see this evolving over the next like 12, 18 months in terms of this uh, observability story? I, I wish I knew what it looked like 12 to 18 months out. I can barely see what it's gonna look like six months out at this point. Um, but I would say, you know, when we started this journey, we really kind of started as purely app dynamics. And what we really have seen is this multifaceted tools where everything is sort of coalescing together. And it's all come, it's all kind of becoming, you know, part of one. It's when someone does a cloud migration, guess what? All these different pieces come together. There's a lot that are beyond that. And you have these multifaceted tools are kind of all over the place. It's increasingly complex. And one of the big keys being things is it's really important. A lot of people miss. It's, it's important to baseline where you're really starting from. If you can't measure where you're starting from, how do you know whether or not your new move towards FSO or towards AI operations is actually effective? because you can't measure that. So you gotta get that baseline measurement and then start from there. And that really starts with SLOs and being able to put those in place. So I wanna bring Jeremy into this and he's gonna give us a demo a little bit later, but Jeremy uh, has the uh, fun task of working with customers on adopting SLOs, right? This is like his life. Um, and you know, coming to that point about baseline you were just talking about, I would love to hear, Jeremy, maybe you can share a little bit, is where, where are people getting this full picture from? We talk this full stack, you know, when they think about their cloud, et cetera, how are you seeing that with real world customers adopting SLOs um, in terms of full stack observability? Well, in terms of full stack observability, there are a lot of places and a lot of tools that people can use to collect metrics. But the thing about that is, you know, you can end up with a ton of metrics and they're telling you how your systems are behaving, but it's not telling you what your users are experiencing. And that's really the most important thing because if a service is behaving poorly, but your users are not impacted, you don't need to wake people up at 3 a.m. to fix that problem. So understanding the level of reliability that you're offering your customers, whether they're internal or external, is the most critical thing. And SLOs are what gives you that insight. And the wonderful thing about SLOs is it shifts the conversation from being about, you know, what's the latency on this Postgres database in Virginia to what experiences our users having when they're checking out of our, of our shop. So it's really customer focused and customer focused is revenue focused. So you're really much closer to the important things that impact your business when you're looking at things from an SLO perspective. And these metrics from the full stack can be brought into SLOs to give you this information. So, so it, it sounds, you know, it sounds nice, but maybe Hans, you can shed some light on this. What's slowing teams down from, I'll use, I'll make a little joke here, fully adopting full stack observability. What, what's slowing people down? I think one thing is, um, the complexity, the growth and complexity is means that there are more teams involved in in having to um, identify what the right things to measure are, um, and 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 you know make good decisions 
on those things. But that means that um, there are now there are, the 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 problem of siloed teams is as much as we all have been drinking DevOps Kool Aid for a long time. You know, their teams are still siloed. They're doing their thing and. Um, and the fact is the, you know, the engineers and the SREs, maybe they, they've been doing cloud native for a long time. Um, you know, they've transitioned their monolithic application to microservices and it's really built for observability. You know, the network teams, the QA teams, the maybe IT ops, I don't, I don't want to point fingers at all, but you know, there's, there's varying levels of maturity and everybody needs to be on the same page. And so, so I think some of that culture and process um, can come into play. Um, and Mike mentioned it before um, in terms of where the complexity is, is growing. So I think over the last 10 years, maybe the transition from monolithic to microservices has meant like, you know, the hardcore engineers have had to deal with the complexity of distributed applications, but now the back end is talking to the Stripe and a hundred other SaaS cloud APIs, and the front end is going to multiple is you know being served up from multiple CDNs in different geo regions, and then there's DNS and how I mean so there's this complexity happening in different places that I think um, it needs to be recognized first of all. So. Um, and I think in some organizations that's not even recognized. And then the teams that are responsible for assuring those, the um, the performance of those services might not be the the you know the engineers um, that are sort of own the application. They might be the networking team and stuff. So um, I think yeah. those are all challenges that companies are are dealing with. And I think full stack of observability part of that is getting everybody on the same on the same page. You know, it's interesting about, you know, when you talk about some of this, these kind of cultural challenges and silos and things like this, but at the same time, as we're trying to have this better alignment of, uh, of different teams, we also have more arm's length relationship too, because the third parties are showing up and it's kind of hard to enforce, you know, a culture of reliability across uh, SaaS boundaries, which I think is kind of interesting, an interesting point there. And Renato, on the AppD side, do you see this as well, what Hans was talking about? Yeah, absolutely. The the culture, the processes for sure. And then it's just the silo. We think about the silos on the organizational side, but the silos spread across the data. So the data itself is also siloed. So you have the networking data done and built for networking people to look at. And then you got the infrastructure data done and built for infrastructure people. And the applications guys are the same. So now you got this three completely or more. You got security. You got all these guys with completely different perspectives on what matters. And now you have to make sense out of that data when you're traversing it. Right? So it's very hard to create, to provide a way for people to jump from one domain to the other, or even realize, you know, if I'm an application person, what type of data do I care from the infrastructure perspective to make a decision or even from the security or from the networking? So having, not only bringing the data in a, in a more meaningful way, it's just, giving the meaning to the persona that's evaluating that data, it's, it's very hard, right? It's not easy. I can give you a NetFlow, like Hans can hand me a ton of NetFlow data if he was collecting it, and I would make no sense out of it. I would look at it like, I don't know what that is, right? So it's, 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 it's a challenge because now you've got to figure it out not only how to bring the data together, but how to make sense out of the data given the different perspectives that are participating in the conversation. So now, speaking of silos, now we toss it over to Mark, who's on the uh, the customer facing side, the channel side of this, bringing together, um, you know, both Apti and Thousand Eyes, right? So, how do you see this this happening from the channel partner perspective? What's your perspective yeah. on this so, I mean, siloing I see, of data? You know, yeah, so there's there's obviously there's, there's a ton more applications that are out there. Increasingly, more and more of those are tied to CX and UX and all those different types of things. And as we're going through this transformation, a lot of this then ties back in again. It's application modernization, things like that. There's also all the ties into cloud-based things. Traditional monitoring does not work in those areas. The tools that they have that provided them visibility in the past don't provide that visibility anymore. So they have to change fundamentally everything about them, how they operate, how they run, retraining of their resources, everything. And there's an increased urgency to move faster and faster. 
the competition, especially for these larger legacy types of organizations, right? The competition is coming up fast and they're built natively this way. These big companies have to transform and they have to do it right now. So there's this urgency to do this as quickly as possible. And they have to have that complete picture of everything. So I want to, it's a very interesting point. I want to pivot to a, a discussion about the role of SLOs in full stack observability. And let's spend a little time on this and then let's get into the demo is what I'd suggest here. So, so I want to come back to Renato for a second on the, the AppD side. You know, where do, how do SLOs fit into FSO, how the full stack observability? I think it's pretty powerful, right? Uh, if you think about measuring KPIs, the KPIs were meant to be done in isolation. So you're always looking at one side only. Um, in, in FSO, as, the, as we start bringing together the domain data and creating correlation between them, uh, the SLOs become quite important because now when you're gonna build an SLO, it may actually be built on top of different SLIs and the SLIs might be coming from different domains. Uh, in the AppDynamics perspective, it gets even more interesting because once we use FSO to make sense out of the data, AppDynamics has a very powerful tool called BIQ, Business IQ, that allows people to elevate all that data to a more meaningful business-driven information. And we can serve that as an SLI for the SLOs now. So now all of a sudden, you can create SLOs that are actually, hey, did my revenue went down or up based on all the data that we're collecting from the FSO platform, or even today from AppDynamics 8000 eyes. So I want to I want to bring it back to Mike because we haven't heard from Mike in a little bit here on the as a end user you know you're you're like full stack observability sounds good maybe a little skeptical about how feasible it is right so if you're if you're tasked with this idea of adopting this new thing and this new kind of approach where do you see SLOs fitting into that in the adoption uh, process? I mean I think uh, based on what Renato just kind of mentioned like this the SLOs and and like the data types being so distinct and not really making sense across some of those siloed boundaries SLOs fit in kind of as early as you can possibly get them in because that is the communication layer that's your vocabulary for your stakeholders for folks that if you're a, an application engineer and you want to know how the network's doing but you don't have that expertise the SLO is your way to understand the health of that service, the health of that network. Uh, so, so to me, like the sooner you can figure that out, the sooner you can describe those uh, pieces of functionality in what's expected and how it's supposed to work and how reliable it's going to be um, for your end users, for your, your customers, your stakeholders of that SLO, uh, the, the sooner you can get feedback to make sure it's, it's matching their expectations that they can comfortably build on top of it and move forward with their, their work. Interesting. So, so Hans on Thousand Eyes, I'm guessing your view on this, and like, correct me if I got this wrong, but the SLO is really about the the end-to-end -end customer experience. Is that how Thousand Eyes fits into the puzzle, or how do you see this uh, the SLOs playing a role in your um, full stack observability? Yeah, and I I just say that this is something that I think we've we've seen for quite some time, um, which is that uh, customers that are able to um, get insight as early as possible in their, whatever you want to call modernization process. And that can be anything from, hey, we're migrating our application to the cloud. Um, how does it, you know, how, we want to understand how it performs maybe even before we pull off, you know, the, the pro pro production migration. Um, and, and uh, or, or it could be, you know, migrating a, uh, you know, internal business applications or, or business SaaS applications and moving from, you know, on-prem solutions to, you know, to, to cloud and SaaS solutions. How does that impact my different, you know, uh, branch offices all over, all over the world? Um, and, and being able to make those measurements and see how those transitions impact uh, end user experience as early as possible. Um, we, we've definitely seen that customers that can do that as early as possible are the most successful, um, and they can show success. Um, you know, like, like like Mike has said, like that is the uh, that is the metric that defines what what success is. So. Well, so we've we've talked a bit about you know I like the word Mike used the vocabulary. You know, we we started this. Um, this discussion around the idea of a common language. And now we're talking about communicating success. So I want to I want to bring this to Mark, because I think you're probably the closest to kind of having to make an ROI justification for some of these transformations, right? And this idea of a common language between the business and technology. So can you speak to how SLOs provide a common language with yeah, companies absolutely. to understand the reliability? 
Yeah. So what I would say is, you know, typically you have there's, you know, between the different teams that sit within, you know, the different parts of reliability, right? If, if you look at that across, so you've got applications, you've got compute, you've got storage, all these different teams, right? And when you have an outage, you've got a, you got a situation, you've got MTTI and MTTR. And everyone knows MTTI is mean time to identification of an issue, but we jokingly refer to it, but realistically it becomes mean time to innocence, right? Everyone's just looking to find out it's not my fault. I didn't do it. It's not, see, it's not, it's network gets blamed first every time, by the way. And network is simply saying, it's not my problem. So you wind up with these infighting between these teams and you really need to get that agreement between those teams and having an SLO now becomes a, we have to come together as one to pull this together. And then there's also the aspect of, you know, not only once you engineering teams together, the business and the technology teams, they don't speak the same way, right? They even will see, they'll use the same, you know, the same, um, uh, the same, the, the same SLO, you know, SLO may mean something to one, something else to another, and the same acronyms, right? There's crossover between them. You give them a common language, and it's really important that they have a common way to speak to things, and they understand the same way. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that that is one of the greatest assets of SLOs, and I think, actually, I want to hop into the demo right now, because the common language is one of the key features of, of Noble9 and value points. Let's stop talking about it. Let's see it. Let's see All it, right. Jeremy. Go ahead. Okay, so I think you guys can see my screen now. Right now, we're looking at the grid view of Noble9. Um, this is where you can see all of your SLOs, and the SLOs are grouped by services. Now, in this case, a service is actually representing a user experience. Now, you can make it whatever you want to be, but most of our new customers tend to make it a user experience. So you might have it be a checkout, a login, or it could be related to a particular page that users do something on. So in this case, we have um, an app portal experience or service, and there are a variety of SLOs for it. So there's an error count, an HTTP response, latency agent, net latency agent. And the beautiful thing about this, now that we're working with AppD and Thousand Eyes is that you can actually have SLOs coming from different places. So if you look at this error count SLO that we have here, it's coming in from AppD. And back to that common language theme, all of these SLOs that we're looking at, we're showing you the reliability burn down, the error budget that's remaining, and the burn rate, which is the current rate at which your error budget is being eaten away. So no matter what the data source is, whether it's coming from AppD or if it's coming from Thousand Eyes, we're still talking about what is the level of reliability that we're giving our customers. And that's a conversation that can be had between both the very technical people and the business side of the house. Everyone can understand what an error budget is, what a percentage remaining is, and the level of reliability that you're giving your customers. And I think at the end of the day, no matter, even though teams have different goals, they all want to be able to provide good service to their customers. Now, from this page, you can see the reliability burn down, the error budget, and the burn rate. But if you dig in a little bit deeper, then we actually give you some more details about the, um, the SLI that's coming in and the level of reliability. So at the top here, you can see some metadata about this particular SLO. And right here, you're looking at the raw data that's being brought in from thousand ops. So as I scroll over this, you can see the metric here values changing. And these red lines are actually the thresholds that have been created for this SLO. So in this case, there's a threshold of 3,000 milliseconds, 4,000 milliseconds, and 5,000 milliseconds, representing OK, slow, and bad. If you scroll down below that, we show you the reliability burn down. So you can actually see how the reliability is performing. Since this is a rolling time window, you can actually get some reliability back. For the less strict thresholds, there was no burn down in this case. And then at the very bottom, you can actually see the error budget burn rate. So when you have a high burn rate, that means that you're probably not gonna make it to the end of your time window. 1X is ideal because if you're at 1X, then that means that at the end of your time window, you will have used up your error budget completely, but you won't have over provided service for your users. Now, when you have an error budget burn rate that is high for an extended period of time, that's probably something that you wanna be notified about. 
And for that, we have alerts. So I want to hop over to the alerting portion of Noble 9 and just show you the ways that we're able to help you be proactive based on these SLIs that are coming in from places like at the Impals and Ops. So the first is looking at when the error budget would be exhausted. What we're going to do here is we're going to look for a trend over a certain amount of time such that your error budget will be exhausted in the next three days or the next four hours or five days. Now, the second one remaining error budget, this gets back to that whole common language thing again, right? Now, if you send out an alert that says the remaining error budget is 10%, this is something that can go to the project managers, as well as the developers, all of the stakeholders, because at this point, you need to make a business decision. Your reliability is at risk. Do you want to move forward with risky behavior? Or should you put certain projects on hold or freeze certain releases? This is something that needs to be discussed and now that you have a common language, it's a much easier discussion to have with all of the parties that are involved. So that's really like my, my, my favorite of the alerts. And the last one is looking for when the uh, average error budget burn rate is above a certain value. So again, it's looking for a trend for a certain amount of time such that the error budget is 3x, 10x, et cetera. So it's letting you know, and this one probably wants the developers, hey, something's broken, users are having a bad experience, we gotta get there and fix it before things time out. Now, these alerts can be sent to a variety of places. Um, they can be sent to Slack so that you can just quickly see it on your desktop pop up, or if you wanna meet the devs where they're, where they're living, it can be sent to Jira and you can actually assign a ticket to someone saying, hey, technical debt impact going on here, um, let's assign this to John so that he can take a look at it. We don't need to wake him up, but he needs to look at this because something's going on. Now, going back to the integrations that we have and the alerts first, you can see that we can send alerts to a variety of places from email, which is in the dinosaur age, to Slack, pager duty, et cetera. But my favorite one is actually the web. Using the web hook, we can send alert pretty much anywhere. And our webhook is fully customizable, and you can use this to trigger automation. So not only is it something that you can use to let people know about a problem, you can actually use it to fix a problem, to adjust your environment and resolve the problem without having to wake somebody up. So anywhere you can, any URL you can send a webhook to, we can send this to. You can customize the header. You can choose what notification details get sent, and then you can actually fully customize the JSONs. And I think this is the killer feature right here because what this means is that you can send this alert anywhere. We do our best to support everything out of the box, but if we don't, hey, you can make the JSON what it needs to be to go where you need it to go. So I think that's pretty awesome. Now, the other type of integrations that we have are data sources. And as you can see here, we support a variety of data sources that you may have in your environment. Um, in this demo, I've been working with AppD and Thousand Eyes, which are two that we run into very often. So let's take a look at what these uh, integrations look like in Noble 9. Um, starting with AppD, you can have a direct or an agent type of integration. Our agents are containerized. They can run in Kubernetes or Docker, very lightweight, and you typically only need one agent to connect to a data source. Now with the direct connection, we're actually running the agent in our environment for you. And what this means is that you don't need to expend any resources. You don't need to ask permission. You just need to use your keys and you can get this agent up and running. So if you need to test something really quickly, it's really easy to do. If you're doing an agent, all you need is the controller URL. And if you're doing a direct connection, then you need the client ID and the client secret from AppD. Now for thousand eyes, it's very easy as well. You're actually gonna get the OAuth bearer token. But again, it's very simple to get things up and running. And then I wanna show you what the um, agent code looks like. Clicking on AppD here, we have an agent running. And this is the agent configuration. So there you can see the YAML that we give you to, um, to get your agent up and running. And then we don't need your client ID or secret. You just put that in the YAML yourself. And then there's the Docker runtime for you to be able to do the same thing within Docker. So again, getting the integrations up and running with AppD or Thousand Eyes is really easy. And within minutes, you can have your data in Noble 9, get those SLIs in there to um, support your SLOs.
Now, going back to the grid view, I do want to show you guys something about creating SLOs in Noble 9. So let's click here and let's click on the wrong one there. At Port Royal Cat, that's where I'm meant to be. So in Noble 9, there are two ways of uh, configuring your SLOs. You can do it in the UI, we have wizards, or you can actually do it in YAML, and I'll show you that momentarily. But it's very simple to create an SLO and you have a ton of flexibility. Um, you're gonna choose your service, as I mentioned, we group them by services. There we've chosen AppD as a data source. And right here, you can actually see that we're using the um, AppD metric path to pull in this data. So you grab that from AppD, pop it in there, and there you go, you have your uh, SLI. We give you a ton of flexibility on your time windows, um, hours, minutes, days. It can be rolling or it can be calendar aligned. We support both occurrences and time slices, and then you can add a number of objectives for your SLO, putting in your target percentage, the experience name, and what value you want to um, use as a threshold. In addition to that, you give it a name, you can assign alert policies, you can actually give things labels, and you can create new labels if you want to. And then here you can actually link off to App Dynamics. I want to show you that because this is pretty cool. So from here, when I was back on that SLI page or the details page, if I click on this link right here, it drops me off into App D. And so the reason we did this is because we're not here to replace any of the monitoring tools that we have. We're here to supplement them. So we want to present the information in a very easy to understand common language. But if you do need to get down and dirty and get really far into the technical aspects of it, we want you to be easily be able to do that. So we allow you to have that link that drops off into that other tool, or you can have it drop off into a run book, or it could go to the page that you're actually monitoring. But again, we're trying to make things very easy for you to move around. Now, I did just show you creating an SLO using the SLO wizard, but everything that you can do in that wizard, you can also do as code. Um, we have a binary, it's named slow cuddle like kubectl, and you can use that to interact via API with Noble Knot. So if you're more of a CLI person, you can come here and you can go slow cuddle, get SLOs, pipe this to a file, Demo.yaml. And now we just brought down all of the YAML that's supporting the, the, um, the organization or the account that we're looking at. So here you can see you have an SLO, you've given it a name, it's part of a project. As I mentioned, we group things by projects and services. And then down here, you can see the query and the objectives that relate to this SLO. So it's very straightforward. It makes sense. It's similar to Kubernetes. It's declarative based. Um, so you won't have a problem or you won't really have to learn anything new to work with the YAML that we're using to support Noble Now. And if you wanted to make changes to it from YAML, you can do that as well. You could do um, apply-f just like you would in Kubernetes. Now, it's great to be able to do things from the command line, but imagine if you could actually do it inside your CI CD pipeline. That's something that's possible. You can actually store your SLOs in a repo. You can keep the file there. So here's an example where we have SLOs stored in a repo, and then you can do pull requests. So now you're actually checking in and approving SLOs before they get deployed into production. So now you have you kind of have a gate so that you know you keep track of what's going on. So in this case, there's a PR, we could merge this request, and then it's gonna trigger a GitHub action. And the GitHub action will run in the background. It will utilize that slow cuddle binary and then push the YAML code up to Noble Knot. So not only can you do things in the UI, you can execute SLOs as code. And this code gets presented in the UI in a common language that everybody can understand, no matter what the data source is, at the thousand eyes, or something else you might be using in your environment.
Now, going back into the Noble 9 UI, I do want to show you one last thing, our service health dashboard. This service health dashboard gives you the high level red, yellow, green light version of the health of your environment. So from here, you can see which services are having problems. So in this case, you can see there's a latency issue in the US, but the EU is fine. So you could dive into this and then do some research, figure out what you wanna do and move on. And the same thing for here. These are the ones that we were looking at earlier. Everything appears to be healthy. We also have reporting in Noble Nine. So if you wanna see how things have been going for an extended period of time, you can do that as well. And this information can be exported out of Noble Nine to a variety of places if you wanted to mix it in with your other reporting. Mix that in with some business reporting or do further analytics on it. It's there for you, we keep the data for two years. Take you back to the grid view here. Um, so I hope now that you have a, a better understanding of how Noble Nine is able to bring in data from tools like Appy, Thousand Eyes, allow you to easily create and manage SLOs, and then display this information in a common language that people, no matter what department they're in, should be able to understand and have discussions about. And with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Kim. Thank you, Jeremy, that was great. High energy demos, that's what I like to see. And I'm gonna welcome the panel back here. Let's just chat a little bit to, to wrap up, but while the, the folks are joining, maybe you can just share, Jeremy, um, can you talk about maybe the process you go through for selecting the SLIs to build out the demo? Because I know this is a common question I hear from people. It's like, what SLOs should I have? How do I pick my, my, my uh, SLIs? Right, yeah. So a lot of times there, there are two places that I like to start with my customers. Um, one of them will be, their KPIs, right? A lot of the applications that people have will allow you to set KPIs. So that means you've already decided something is important. So you probably should have an SLO for that to make sure that it's behaving as it should. Now, the second aspect or path I should say are things that you already have alerts for. If you have an alert for something, then that means that when it breaks, it probably impacts users. Therefore, it should have a certain level of reliability so that your users aren't impacted. Therefore, it makes a perfect SLI for an SLO. So um, welcome back, everybody. Mark, on, on average, with the larger customers you're working with, um, how many observability tools are they typically, are you typically seeing? Do people just have one observability tool for the whole stack or what? I wish. You know, I would say typically you're seeing anywhere between 15 and 20. The most I've seen is 39, you know, and 39 tools. I mean, when, when you have 39 tools all coming together, it becomes nothing but noise. If everything is alerting, right? How do you actually make sense of that? So it's, and, it tends to be expansive. So Renato, <laughs> how do you see the integration between app dynamics and, um, and Noble nine helping your customers with full stack observability? I, I love the way it is set up right now because it allows the Noble 9 uh, SLO capabilities to oversee any metric we have. And today, AppDynamics already collects infrastructure, application, some networking metric, and in FSO, it's just going to expand. So it will give our customers the freedom to go and create SLOs. Um, and it's different and it complements what we do, right? Our alerts are normally based on our baselining or, or the metrics itself. With the SLO alerting, you now have alerts that will be about your burn rate, right? Uh, and, and things like that, which we don't currently have. So, so Mark, really oh, I want to come back to Mark on this, actually, because I asked you before if, how many they have, but actually, it's an interesting question. Do most customers have both Thousand Eyes and App Dynamics? Are you seeing that pattern a lot? Yeah, I would say I'm definitely seeing that. We're seeing a lot of our customers that have both. And the reality is, is you know if, if you they, they do different things or different use cases for them but the reality is when you pull them together there's actually it becomes it's an, it's, it's a case of one plus one there's this multiplying effect one plus one is no longer two one plus one becomes four and i think the other thing is you know having having you know noble nine in there as an integration point 
with that SLO factor really kind of pulls them together in a greater fashion. And now it's the three tools become nine tools, the equivalent. You know, it's a, in a lot of cases, we like to say that less is actually more. It's picking the correct tools and correct picking the right tools that you need for them. And that's really critical. I like how it added up to nines. You know, I'm kind of obsessed with nines myself. So uh, we got a couple cu questions from the audience I want to take real quick, if you guys don't mind. So let me just uh, uh, ask here. Uh, okay, what if I have non-app dynamics or thousand eyes data? Maybe um, uh, Jeremy isn't kind of addressing the demo. What if they've got data from other, uh, we won't say the names of any other monitoring systems, of course, but uh, uh, what, what, what happens if people have other stuff? How does that work? If people have other stuff, that's not a problem for us. Um, right now, we support over 15 different data sources to bring in SLIs from, um, and they come from a variety of types of data. You know, they're not just all APM tools, and we're continuing to grow that list. So if you don't happen to be using those tools, there is support most likely for you in the Novo 9 product. One of the things I think is kind of cool with that is it helps with the transition too. So if you are adopting, you know, maybe you're considering app dynamics or thousand eyes, you haven't gone there yet. You've got some other tools in place, you know, maybe that helps you kind of open the door to get a small footprint going and, and not have to, you know, lift and shift uh, your monitoring. Right. Uh, okay. Yep. So I got another, another question kind of related. Um, how do I avoid lock-in to a particular vendor by adopting uh, SLOs and FSO? Do I need one vendor for the full stack? And and I think you were talking a little bit, Jeremy, about the code. Maybe this is a good one for Mike to talk about, because I know, Mike, do you want to talk about open SLO? Maybe this is a good place to, to kind of talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, to avoid vendor lock-in around the, the SLO side of things, I think uh, folks that have, have gone through the, the SLO book or the, SRE, the old SRE workbook, um, the, the data that comes out of SLOs can be pretty well defined in a standard format. And I think that's what we've been trying to push for with the open SLO uh, spec is this common unified way to describe what your SLO behavior would look like, including things like alerting, including things uh, like the related services, the notifications tied to them. Uh, and so that's, that's a really great way. I think it, the, the spec currently is pretty close to what um, the, the YAML that you saw during the demo that Jeremy was uh, kind of showing off. And I think we'd, we'd, have, we'd, we'd hope to align with that continually long-term um, and if, if you're looking to adopt SLOs and you want to, again, keep them in a format that is more neutral, that you can bring across different platforms, OpenSLO is a great way to get started there. It is undergoing a lot of change right now, but we're always open to community feedback and adding more support for functionality that folks are looking to add into, you know, su support their use cases for SLOs. So, yeah, definitely check it out if you, if you haven't yet. And people want to get into OpenSLO, where do they go? I think it's OpenSLO.com. <laughs> I think. Nice. Uh, okay, I got one last question I want to take, and I think I'm going to maybe ask Hans to take this one. Um, you know, we talked about Thousand Eyes acquisition, and somebody brought up the question, okay, so with the acquisition of Epsigon, does that add to this story? Um, would this kind of reinforce the commitment Cisco has? What do you see the direction there for full stack? Yeah, I mean, I think it 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 just kind of um, it just highlights sort of what I alluded to at the beginning with the the where Cisco is um, is is heading and it underscores the Cisco's commitment to full stack of observability and really that it's all about the application. Um, and the line between the network and the application is becoming more, more fuzzy. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think, um, I, I think it just, it, it just underscores, um, you know that uh, that that move towards giving the the end user um, a, a, re a real degree of observability from from the customer, the end user all the way to the application. Awesome. Well, with that, I want to thank everyone for all the attendees that came. Really great turnout today. Thanks for your questions and your attention, and thanks Jeremy for a flawless demo. And of course, thanks to the panel uh, for your really amazing insight. I think this uh, this discussion was. Um, I feel like I even learned a few things, which you know doesn't normally happen. So that's great. Uh, I wanted to just share one last thing before we um, before we wrap up, um, which is uh, how you can get started with uh, Noble Nine. And we just announced yesterday um, Hydrogen. And Hydrogen is the quick and easy way to get started with SLOs, and you can sign up with no credit card and without talking to a salesperson, which I know makes people really excited. Um, and it works with uh, App Dynamics, Thousand Eyes, and many other systems right out of the box. So you can get started in a few minutes and do exactly what Jeremy just did. So uh, definitely encourage anyone out there who wants to do that uh, to check that out. And of course, reach out to any of the folks uh, on the panel here 
on LinkedIn or Twitter or email. I'm sure you can find us all very easily. So anyway, with that, I want to thank everybody and uh, let's slow. Bye, everyone. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thank Appreciate it. Bye.